Hi, I'm Ben Jackson from Ecometrics and Creighton University, here to talk about monitoring aspects of beaver wetland restoration. In 2022, Jessica presented about partnering with beavers to restore wetlands. Today, we are going to look at one project where we did just that. Specifically, this talk will focus on the monitoring. Jessica showed you these talks, or these photos in her 2022 talk. The one on the left is a bee beaver stream reach that we wanted to treat. The one on the right is a reach just upstream that's a full-on beaver wetland. So Jess reminded us that when beavers are present the way they were before they were extirpated, they create and maintain wetlands like this in a positive feedback loop. Riparian vegetation and wood supports beavers as food and building materials. Beavers build dams and channels to create their own habitat. Then these structures raise and spread water, creating ponds, wetland, and hyporic flow. These support riparian vegetation and wood that in turn supports more beavers. So our goal is to get this biological engine back up and running. So that's what we set out to do. Everybody says that we need more monitoring, but few people are actually explicit about what that means. When it comes to monitoring anything, the most important question is what to monitor and why. In engineering and design build efforts, we start out with a purpose, define objectives, design to meet those objectives, build it, and maintain it. The purpose of monitoring is usually to determine whether your objectives are being met. Each objective is like a hypothesis you can test with metrics informed by data. So you should all be scratching your head right now, or at least raising an eyebrow. This model presumes we are taking control of the ecosystem to make it behave the way that we want, which, as Jessica just explained, is actually not our intent at all. So in process-based restoration, you don't design riverscapes or wetlands to meet specific objectives. You prompt their own recovery so that they can resume natural functions. You diagnose the problems that, dis they, that disrupt natural processes, treat them, and care for them in a long term with good stewardship and adaptive management. Like Jessica just said, you don't design processes, you enable their natural recovery. So in other words, you can have a specific human or societal purpose. In process-based process restoration though, you don't just design systems to meet those goals, you restore ecosystems and appreciate the degree to which physical, chemical, and biological processes serve and that purpose naturally. You don't just make up objectives. You set expectations based on what natural processes are capable of in healthy restored ecosystems. The way we think about it, the most important things to monitor are the natural processes that best serve the purpose or benefits or benefits you or your sponsors hope to achieve. So the graphic I have here is from Bed Goldfarb's 2018 Science Magazine article titled Beavers Rebooted, which beautifully illustrates some of, some of the natural processes we expect to be reignited when a beaver wetland is restored from a channelized stream. And that goes from the left to the right. The first process most people realize is that beaver complexes retain water. We can expect increased surface water area. This aspect is important because it indicates the amount of aquatic habitat available to species that need it, like fish and amphibians, aquatic mammals, waterfowl, microinvertebrates, birds. In fact, most species use aquatic habitat for some portion of their lives. Surface water area also makes beaver wetland restoration a bit contentious, as Mark will discuss next, so that's another great reason to monitor it. Most of the water retained in restored beaver wetland is underground. The illustrator shows this by the height of the water table in cross section. We can measure and monitor water table heights by installing wells with water level sensors in the ground and these data can be used to estimate the volume of water retained on site and to track how that changes through a season and from year to year. The illustration shows an increase in riparian vegetation density, complexity, and biomass as the system becomes more natural. There are myriad ways we can monitor these vegetation changes. Habitat diversity and complexity emerge from fluvial and biological processes in healthy beaver wetlands. Again, there are lots of ways to measure and track these aspects. So my background is in ecological studies. So the thing that motivates me to the most to restore these ecosystems is support for all the plants and animals that depend on them and that are needed to maintain its natural functions. I'm certain that healthy beaver wetlands support a much greater variety of all kinds of taxa, wider trophic structure, more interconnected food webs, a greater variety of intra and inter-specific interactions, more niches, and greater overall complexity than degraded and simplified stream channels. The possibility to learn more about them through monitoring is very exciting. So there's a wide variety of processes that serve all kinds of human purposes and motivations. So there's no real shortage of questions to answer or things to learn. When people ask us, what should we monitor? 
I think the best answer is whatever you think is most important or most interesting. What do you want to learn? There's really no cookbook for this. So while we found it useful to incorporate as many of these metrics as possible at a given site, 15 minutes goes quickly, so I will focus on the hydrological responses today. So here's our site with the stream flowing right to left. The upstream part above the central road is a reference where beavers are currently present. This corresponds with the right side of Ben's diagram. The downstream part where beavers are absent corresponds to the degraded condition on the left side of Ben's diagram. This is the site that we targeted for restoration. <coughs> First, let's jump into the surface water area. The aerial photo shows the extent of surface water mapped in white and the red lines are beaver dams. The graph shows surface water area expresses the percentage of total riparian area over the time that monitoring has been conducted. The lower yellow line represents these values for a treatment site where there are no beavers and the stream is a simple channel. The blue line is the reference where the beavers are present. In 2017, the treatment site was at 5% and the reference site was at about 17%. In 2020, surface water area on the treatment site before we did any work stayed constant at about 5%. It expanded from 17 to 24% on the reference site as beavers built more dams. Variability, variability like this is typical of beaver wetlands in our area. It's an example of the kaleidoscope streams that Jessica mentioned. <coughs> In 2021, the reference site dropped slightly to 19%, and the treatment site remained at about 5%. In 2022, we built structures to mimic beaver activity on the treatment reach, shown as red dots. Despite our best effort, surface water area only rose from about 5% to 7%. The reference site bumped back up from 19 to 23% over the same time. The initial response to treatments was less than the natural variability on the reference. So the big change happened in 2023 after beavers reoccupied the site and took over the maintenance, jumping up from seven all the way to 28%. The reference site also rose in that time from 22 to 35%. Immigration of beavers to the section we treated was the real difference maker, highlighting the importance of restoring nature's own natural processes. So surface water area, like I just showed you, is actually not too difficult to measure. We survey a bunch of benchmarks and targets using RTK GPS. Then Dave flies the site with his RTK equipped drone, maps it with structure from motion software, and corrects it to the surveyed targets. This captures a spatially accurate and precise aerial image. We digitize surface water area on the maps using GIS and field check it with handheld RTK. This is Dirk Rasmussen from Colorado Open Lands standing on the edge of surface water. To compare year to year, we shoot for similar stream discharge and times of year. So now let's poke into the ground and look at the water down there. What we are going for is a real life picture of the groundwater elevations across the valley, similar to what Emily Fairfax and Andrew Whittle conceptualized in their diagram of how beaver wetlands resist fire in their Smokey the Beaver paper. Here's a map of our treatment site. The light blue dots are where we installed groundwater monitoring wells. Arranging them in cross sections allows us to plot water elevation across a valley. The hard part in monitoring water table levels is getting enough sample points. There's an incredible amount of spatial, spatial variability on these sites. The equipment is expensive, and it's pretty hard to install. Trust me, I know. <laughs> this is me pulling rocks out of a murky well hole we had to dig by hand. So manual augers make things a little bit easier. It's tough because we can't just bring a machine into most of these sites. The wells are simple slotted PVC pipes equipped with pressure transducers that measure water height every hour. We survey everything on cross sections so we can accurately plot the graphs. <clears throat> so here is the water depth we get from one well, with date on the x-axis and water elevation on the y. You can see when water elevation rose at this well after our mimicry treatments in 2022, and then went even higher in 2023 after the beavers moved in. For reference, the blue line is ground elevation. So we can then plot these elevations on a cross section and interpolate to get a rough idea of where the static water table is across a wetland and how that changes over time. This is done by combining our known water levels in the wells and where it is observable on the surface to create our best estimates for groundwater depth across the valley. So this plot shows the groundwater elevation for the upstream most cross section. First, we will see where it was before any treatments were done. And then this is the same graph a year later, after the installation of mimicry structures. Next, we have the same graph again, but after beavers had recolonized the site. Now we move on to the second cross-section. 
We will see the same set of graphs for this section, looking at the groundwater level pretreatment, after mimicry, and after beaver recolonization. The differences between this graphic and the previous explicitly highlight just how much beaver recolonization affected the groundwater, kicking water all the way up into this pond. So we can then move on to the next cross section, looking first at pretreatment, then after the mimicry structures, and then after the beavers came back. The same process was repeated twice more, looking at pretreatment, after mimicry structures, and after beaver recolonization. We then add additional graphics to show the effect that runoff has on the water table. Notice a uniform increase of about six inches to a foot across the valley from the last graphic. So we then get to our last cross section and again look at pretreatment, <coughs> after mimicry structures, and after beaver recolonization, and during runoff. So before we conclude, I would like to take a second to consider other metrics for fu the future of beaver restoration monitoring. Through my study of various ecological systems, the importance of recording and understanding biodiversity has become rather apparent. While the observation of beavers is already a large part of our monitoring efforts, more could be done to incorporate the whole spectrum of species diversity. One way that Sarah Marshall from CNHP paints this picture is by using auditory recording devices to record the unique calls of various bird species. Using this technology, Sarah has already identified the American crow, vesperpsarrow, tree swallow, red-tailed hawk, house finch, mallard, hairy woodpecker, spotted towhee, Wilson's warbler, and many other bird species, quadrupling the list that they got from field surveys. While the primary purpose is to ID and record species, auditory recordings can also provide glimpses into various inter- and intraspecific interactions, like a predator tracking down a mallard right in front of the microphone, which made for a pretty fun listen. Understanding these interactions and the diversity of species at a site provides new ways to evaluate system health, incorporating all the aspects of an ecosystem and its natural functions. Thank you all for listening.